one of these trees is the sun. And you can see that the tree, the, the smaller tree, the younger tree has grown in the shadow of the great tree. Hey guys, I'm Harmony Klingenmeyer and welcome to Hope Arises. This show exists solely to inspire and empower you to hear, steward, and obey the voice of the living God. I don't know about you, but what drives me on a daily basis is His voice. The power of what He has spoken in me, over me, and through me. Whether it comes from the scripture or it comes from directly from His Spirit. Both are so valuable to me and they're part of the intimacy that I share with God. And it feels personal to me. It feels like God is saying, especially in this season, will you steward my voice? Will you listen to my voice? Do you know what He's saying to you? Did you know that God has something special to say to each one of us? He does every single day and I don't know what that's like to live without his voice it's, it's been a part of my life since I was a little girl and I know part of that is because of the amazing impact of my parents and grandparents but I want to let you know that God's voice is available to all of his children it's like if you could imagine a father who only spoke to one of his children can you imagine that? No. Or even if he had two or three that were his favorites, but the others he didn't speak to at all. Can you imagine a father with a loving heart um, behaving like that? I can't. And, and yet that is how we treat God. We treat God like the gift of the prophetic uh, is only for certain people. And when we say the gift of the prophetic, we believe that the people who operate in the prophetic hear God's voice, that they hear God speaking for themselves, for, for other individuals, for the church, and for the world. And I'm, I'm sorry I disagree. I think he speaks to all of us, every single person, which means I believe that the prophetic is really for everyone. And, and um, I know that I've seen the most incredible fruit in my life when I've stewarded the things that God has said to me. And that's why I created Hope Arises. I created this show to inspire others to listen carefully to what God is saying in this season. What is he saying about you? What is he saying about your kids, about your marriage, about the church? I believe it is our privilege as the children of Daddy God to hear what he has to say. Last week when we were together, we began to talk about one of my favorite Bible uh, characters. His name is Barnabas. I love Barnabas for many reasons. Um, but the most powerful thing about Barnabas is that he was renamed. He was moved from the kingdom of Israel <clears throat> as a Levite, from one priesthood, from one nation, into another. He was moved from the kingdom of Israel into the kingdom of Jesus. He was moved from the priesthood of the Levites into the messianic priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Isn't that powerful? And along with his new belonging came a new name. He was born with the name Joseph, but the apostles who were spiritual dads to Barnabas gave him a brand new name and that name was Barnabas. And his name is so powerful because when the apostles released this name into his life, they were releasing a prophetic word over him. They were releasing the voice of the Lord over his life, telling him that he was called to be something. And if we look at the, the, the meaning of the name Barnabas, it's just incredible what this name means. It's the, it's the um, joining together of two words, bar, which means son, and 
the nabus or um, in the in the that's Aramaic. Um, it means encouragement. It also means the one who advocates. And in the in the Greek in the book of Acts, the word that they use when they describe the name Barnabas, they they actually translate it for us in the fourth chapter of Acts. They say that the name means son of encouragement. But this this word encouragement is another name for the Holy Spirit, and it means advocate the one who stands before the courts of God and um, offers evidence on behalf of someone else is that not incredible it's so powerful because then as we see Barnabas beginning to walk in the call of God upon his life what we see about him is that he was offering evidence on behalf of someone else whose name was Saul so we're going to start right now. We're going to jump right into the scripture. Um, last week's lesson ended with a description of Saul's conversion. In this, that same chapter, chapter 9, we see that Saul immediately begins to preach the gospel and then he travels to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he begins to have some difficulties. Let's listen and find out, starting in verse 26. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. So what did Barnabas do in verses 27 and 20, uh, in verse 27? It's incredible. He presents evidence on behalf of Saul. He presents evidence of Saul's true conversion. And who does he present it to? Well, his spiritual fathers, the ones who named him Barnabas. Isn't that incredible? It's so powerful. Here he is, he's saying, fathers of the church, I am here to present evidence on behalf of someone who, for, for good reason. The church is deathly afraid of this man. And yet I know something to be true about him and I'm going to present it to you. And because of Barnabas's words, let's see what happens. Verse 28 says, so Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Wow. Not only did Saul become accepted by the church at Jerusalem, it was as if Barnabas held the door of favor, held the door of honor, held the door of connection open so that Saul could walk through. And this, this is a really powerful truth that Barnabas, he didn't just see himself as, well, these are my spiritual fathers and these, these, these are the relationships that I have stewarded or I have um, been given. He saw himself as a doorway so that other people could come into relationship with the apostles, so that other people could become connected with the body of Christ. And now we see in verse 28, Saul is immediately traveling around Jerusalem in the company of the 12 apostles and they are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ together. In verse 29, it says, he debated with some of the Greek speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. Well, this is, this is a powerful example of um, reaping what you sow, don't you think? It's not that Saul didn't have to deal with consequences. He did. He had a lot of bad seed that he had sown. He had done a lot of things that had broken people's trust. And here we see his life is threatened in the same way that he had threatened other people's lives. So let's see what happened. When the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus, his hometown. The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit it also grew in numbers wow so what did the apostles decide to do well they decided to send Saul home 
He was a, a source of contention. He was a problem child, you might say, and he presented a conundrum. And so they made an executive decision to send Saul back to Tarsus, his hometown. Wow. That had to be in some ways pretty hard for Saul. But it's interesting because if we move forward and look, see if I can find those verses. If we jump forward to the chapter 11 and we start in verse 19, we see um, something amazing happening. So let's just jump right into the scripture and see what it says. Let's start in verse 22. When the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, and, and maybe we should start a little bit farther back just so we can get a picture of what did happen. Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Wow. When the church of Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent who? Barnabas to Antioch. So now Barnabas is on an assignment from his spiritual fathers, the apostles. Verse 23 says, When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. What did he do? He walked in his identity in the name that he had been giving, encouraging the, the new believers to uh, stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith. And many people were brought to the Lord. Verse 25 says, Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. Oh my goodness, was this part of his assignment? Was that part of his assignment? I don't think it was. It doesn't say so in the verses. It says nothing about visiting Saul. But can you imagine, Saul is building tents. He's making tents in Tarsus. It doesn't say he's walking in the call of God in his life. It doesn't say that he's teaching or preaching. It doesn't say that he's, um, you know, debating or being an apologist on behalf of the gospel. It doesn't say anything. All we know is that Saul is sitting in Tarsus and man, Barnabas is about to intervene in his life. Barnabas is about to come on the scene, pull him out of early retirement and help him begin to walk in the call of God on his life. So it says, then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Mm. During this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them was named Antioch. Uh, Agabus, who stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the spirit that the great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius. So the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could. This they did, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take, the, to, to, take to the elders of the church at Jerusalem. Wow. This is incredible to me. Barnabas rescued Saul. He said, you know what? In the same way that I opened a door for you in Jerusalem to become connected to the apostles there, I am gonna open a door for you in Antioch. And I am gonna walk alongside of you as you begin to fulfill the call of God in his life, on your life. This is incredible. You know that everyone needs a Barnabas in their life. Every single person that we come in contact with on a daily basis, we are called to look into them and see the greatness and beauty of God and begin to pull 
it out. We're called to use our voices to activate the call of God on other people's lives. And when other people around that person, maybe they won't have anything to do with them. Maybe they're a recovering alcoholic or addict and they've been down that road and around that mountain many times and people don't trust them. People don't trust that they've really changed. How many times have you heard that? Every one of those people, if we want to see them actually really change, what they need is community and connection. They need the people around them to begin to call out the God nature and character within them. Would they need a Barnabas to say, no, you're not going to sit in Tarsus and build tents. You're coming with me to Antioch and I'm going to walk alongside of you. I am going to be the accountability you need. I am going to be the encouragement you need. And I am going to be your advocate in front of other people who won't have anything to do with you. I know I have myself have been in moments where I needed someone to see God in me. And God sent specific people into my life who believed in me, who loved on me, who spoke truth over me. And when I wasn't around, they spoke about me with love and kindness. They were fair and just, and they were merciful and compassionate. And I know there's some people in your life that need you to be that for them. I know personally, I've heard people say, man, I could really use a Barnabas in my life. And my response to them is, once you become a Barnabas, you see them everywhere. Once you decide that you're not going to wait for someone else, but you're going to become what other people need, then all of a sudden it's like they come out of the woodwork. You see them everywhere. You see all the people who are currently believing in you, currently loving you you and you begin to appreciate and value what they're doing for you nobody does it perfectly obviously except for christ and you know what the scripture teaches that jesus is sitting at the right hand of the father as we speak making intercession for you and what does that mean he is next to the father saying to the father do you see my do you see your son do you see your daughter down there? Do you see them, Father God? Let your will come to pass in their lives. Let everything that you have decreed for them come to pass. Christ is Barnabas. Christ is the one who advocates on our behalf, on our behalf and the Holy Spirit who continually comforts and encourages us to walk in the call of God upon our lives. We're not alone even when it feels like it. We're not alone. Isn't that incredible? You know, Barnabas was willing to take a risk for another person's identity. Sometimes people need us to take a risk for them. And I'm gonna be honest, not everyone is demonstrating behavior that's quote unquote worth the risk. And even those people, they need somebody who will believe in them. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy if you've had a, a child, for example, who's been in jail or, or who has a, a, a habitual behavior that, um, and, and, and it seems as though um, they're never gonna change. But the, the problem with that is, is that the, God intends for them to be restored with the same passion that he has for you and your restoration. And if he can do it for me and he can do it for you, he can do it for anyone. I truly believe that. And you know what? As a foster mom and adoptive mom, I've had the incredible privilege to walk alongside of biological mommies who chose to turn their lives around, who chose to um, step into wholeness. And it's hard. The spirit of addiction does not want to let go of people, but these women are brave. And you know what? They're not doing it alone because I'm with them in that process. I'm the Barnabas in their life. I'm the one coming alongside of them saying, no, you're not going to do this alone. I'm going to risk. I'm going to take a risk for you. And I'm going to believe for you. And I'm going to help you restore your family and your generational lines and the blessing that is called to be upon your children. I am going to help you walk in that blessing. And I'm going to help you walk of the call of God upon your life. And we all need that. 
So we have to change our mindset. We have to stop saying there's some people who are too far gone. If you believe that, uh, the issue isn't those people. It's our belief system. And Papa God can broaden and expand our belief system. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Holy Spirit is coming? Some, sometimes he comes to us and confronts too small of a belief system, a belief system that says some people are, they're just too far gone or some people, they just don't want it. Well, I know, I know in my own life, having been set free from lesbianism, having been set free from um, compulsive spending, having been set free from pornography, I always wanted freedom. And it was the goodness and kindness and mercy of God that he walked me into freedom. And he surrounded me with people who helped me walk into freedom. And I'm asking you, and I feel like I'm speaking right to somebody right now. I'm asking you to believe for miracles. I'm asking you to advocate for people who maybe don't deserve it. I'm asking you to speak life into, into people who it seems like they're walking in death. I'm asking you to take another risk because love always risks for others. And it's worth it. It's worth it. Let's see the fruit, the fruit of Barnabas' obedience to advocate for a man named Saul. Let's turn to the uh, chapter 13 of the book of Acts. We're just making our way through the book of Acts today. Starting in verse 1. Among the prophets and teachers of the church of Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, and Menaean, the childhood companion of King Herod, Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day... As these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. You know, the interesting about, thing about this scripture is although um, we don't see the word apostle, in these verses, we see some really telltale signs that what's happening here is that the prophets and the teachers are declaring the apostolic call of God upon, upon Barnabas and Saul's lives. When they had fasted and prayed, the prophets and teachers laid their hands on these two men, Barnabas and Saul, and then they sent them. And this word sent, is the word for apostle in the Greek. It is uh, the same, apostolos, is the same as the word apostle because apostle actually means the sent ones. And so here we have Barnabas and Saul moving from a tent maker, well, let's start before that, a, uh, a Pharisee of Pharisees of the house of Benjamin, as Paul describes himself later on in his epistles. He was a Pharisee first, a persecutor of the church, a murderer as he approved of the murder of Stephen and others. Then he's a convert preaching the gospel, but nobody wants anything to do with him. He's rejected by the church and his life is threatened on all sides. And actually we find out throughout the entire extent of his saved life, he experiences deep uh, and painful persecution. But then we see him as a conundrum and an anomaly sent away from the church to Tarsus. He's sent home go home. It, this is, it's too much of a problem. And so we're going to send you home. And there he is building tents in Tarsus. And yet he doesn't stay there because of a man called Barnabas. Barnabas gets him out of his early retirement. And now he is amongst the prophets. First, he's, he's a, a carrier of finances. So he carries the blessing that the churches have gathered back to Jerusalem. So he's just a messenger. And now we see him. Who is he? He is named amongst the prophets and the teachers of the church of Antioch. So we see the man is growing and progressing in the call of God upon his life, all because of a man named Barnabas. 
And then finally, we see both Barnabas and Saul released into their apostolic calling. This is an, just an incredible story. And here in verse 9 of chapter 13, we finally see the birthing of a new identity in the same way that Barnabas was given a new name, Saul steps into a new identity as Paul in verse 9. It says, Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. Then he said, you son of the devil. Wow, what conviction and what uh, courage and confidence, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good. Will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Wow, incredible. In verse 13, Paul and his companions then left Paph Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port of Perga. There John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. But Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia. Now this is the incredible thing. In their culture, the name of prominence always comes first. So up until this moment, we always see Barnabas and Saul. For example, in verse uh, two of chapter 13, dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work. In verse four, so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit etc etc then in verse 9 Saul's name is changed to Paul and all of a sudden we see that the order has changed verse 14 but Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia Paul has stepped into his full identity as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and Barnabas is right there to see it happen Wow, can you imagine what is possible? Can you imagine what is possible? If we will walk one another, if we will encourage, uplift one another, and walk with one another into the fullness of the call of God upon, uh, upon one another's lives. I'm, I'm, right now I'm thinking of two incredible, um, a brother and sister in the Lord who walk with me. Audrey Frabel and Sean Konoposky, a mighty woman of God, a mighty man of God, both serving in the local church with me, both believing in me and loving me and calling me into the greater things of God. And I am doing the same for them. We need one another. So right now I wanna pray for you at the end of this teaching. If you are hungry for beautiful, connection in the body of Christ for relationships where you can be built up and begin to step out in the call of God upon your life. I want to pray that God will surround you with Barnabases. And I also want to pray that you would begin to call others into the anointing and calling upon their lives. Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful that you are the greatest advocate and the one who sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are living inside of us and that you are the comforter, the encourager, and the advocate, the one who speaks on our behalf before the throne. Oh God, we're so grateful for who you are in our lives, that you do not leave us alone, that we are not called to be isolated, God, but that we are called to be one with you and with one another. I pray today for those listening to this teaching that they would arise in strength to be a Barnabas in someone else's life, that they would take a risk for the call of God on someone else's life. And right now I impart to the listener an increase in the prophetic gift upon their lives, that they would begin to see the bigness of God and other people and begin to call out the gold. Oh God, I pray that your children would begin to see themselves as prophetic, that they would begin to see themselves as the stewards of your voice, oh God, and that they would begin to speak your voice over others. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you so much for joining me 
for Hope Arises today. I bless you in the name of Jesus, and I look forward to seeing you next week on Tuesday at 4 p.m. Blessings.